Hello, I am Shara Gorbani, the founder and director of Project Control Academy, where we help you master your knowledge and skills in project controls. Today, I have the honor of talking to Michael from Risky Project. So, thank you so much, Michael, for accepting this interview and talking more about uh, Risky Projects and what this tool can bring. Okay, you're welcome. Before uh, talking about the tool and uh, the solution that it provides, uh, Michael, can you tell us, uh, uh, in your opinion, what are the challenges that we face in project controls at the moment? Well, obviously, the biggest one is that when we look at we look at the organizations as a whole, that we suffer from uh, cost overruns, probably. Uh, depending on who you talk to, about 70% of projects have uh, meet don't meet either cost or schedule or technical performance, uh, and that's pretty something that's been going on uh, very consistently, despite all the changes and improvements in uh, software and there's new methodologies, uh, and it's 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 remained very uh, constant. So we. We haven't really eroded that very much, so with it, it's still, still a major concern. So, in terms of cost overrun, then uh, what would we, what do you think as a solution, or how the tool that you have developed would kind of bring some solution to that problem? Well, <laughs> so the tool is always as the tool is only as good as the information that's coming in. Exactly. So, and. Uh, we actually have about three books that we've written, and we've written very extensively, and on our website. And it really the the reason why we have 70% cost overruns or schedule, and we're really not being very successful on that, is the human element. And the the human element is the one thing that's really really hard to address. It's uh, uh, as my partner. Uh, Dr. Lev Virin had said is that we all suffer from the same uh, situation, the human condition, our you know, bounded reality is what it is. We can only understand so much, we can only comprehend so much, and the guy who's digging the ditch or the guy who's up and the CEO of a major company suffer from the same condition. The only difference is if the guy who's digging the ditch, uh, makes a mistake, maybe there's a little bit of flood or something, but if the CEO does it, uh, like with the major banks or something, we have a major global recession. But it's still the same underlying condition that we have. So the only way you're really going to address that is then put in tools and methods that manage our own shortcuts. We have to accept that we have those, and you have the ones that accept it and manage those. Okay, very well said, Mike. How about Risky Project? Can you tell us more about Risky Project and what does it do? So our part of it, we don't see as, as, as being the complete solution to anything. Really what we are is part of the toolkit within any sort of project management group, uh, project controls. We're trying to make sure that people are, um, first of all, are doing the thinking process behind what could go wrong with your project. What's going to happen to your project? What obstacles are, could happen? And if they do occur, what would be the impact of that? And finally, what can you do about it? So that's, it's like three questions. You know, risk, people get very, very nervous around risk management, but it's three questions. What could go wrong? What would happen if it goes wrong? And what can you do about it? I mean, it gets more complex after that about how you do it, but if you can do that at the very beginning of every project, you've got, you'll go a long way to improving your prospects. Definitely. So tell us about uh, like the risky project. Does so, it incorporate cost uh, risk as well, or just the schedule risk? It does. Uh, it does cost integrate. You can do cost schedule, and it also does qualitative. So if you have performance, safety, legal, reputation, really depending on how you want to set your system up, but it, it actually can do both at the same time. So we do, uh, the core of our software is actually running a qu quantitative, we use Monte Carlo simulations, but even with the non, -quanti typically quantitative, we actually use the same calculation engine uh, and we use our algorithms to apply uh, quantitative 
uh, we, we call it utils, to those qualitative, like safety or something. So we can actually, they, we can measure them. It's, we're sort of looking at like versus like, and so we can say which ones are their highest priority. So is it cost? We can measure it on cost, we can measure it on schedule, we can measure it on safety or legal, or we can measure if uh, most risks will impact multiple categories, we call it. And we can say what's the cumulative impact and which one would be the highest priority. So which, which ones do you want to address first? Okay. You've only got so much money and time and resources to uh, address your or manage your risk, so which ones should you hit first? That's really what it comes down to. Okay, very nice. And how about the challenges in terms of the implementation of uh, risky projects? Because let, let's say we are already having some tool in our company and tomorrow we want to adapt risky project. In your opinion, what would be the most uh, important or the challenge, uh, the number one challenge that a company would face in terms of adopting the tool? Okay, uh, it really depends. Are they doing risk already? Are they doing quantitative or qualitative? Uh, Typically, the biggest problem that we have is most people uh, feel extremely busy as it is, and they see it as being another another task. Another task that they and they're not quite sure what the value of it because no one wants to do anything mm -hmm. that when they don't actually see the result or the benefit of it. That they don't want to be involved in busy work. That's why we all hate going to meetings. <laughs> right. Because you're sitting there and you're like, oh God, okay, you know. This is the fifth meeting I've been at today, and I've gotten nothing done, and I really want to get back to my I hear you. work. Yeah. yeah. And so, a lot of times, what we come up, and people will be, they'll realize they have a need, uh, but I, I call it they are so busy drowning that they can't reach out to get the life raft or the life, you know, the life preserver, because they, they figure if they stop, if they stop sort of swimming, they're going to drown. So they're in a very crisis situation. Uh, and they're not able to sort of stop and take a big breath, slow things down and say, okay, how can we address this? And so it really, a lot of times we get people who are like, it's been going on for 10 years now. And uh, uh, they, they know that they have to do something. People who, if it comes in from the top and said, we're going to do risk analysis and management all the time, and the, uh, the underlying people who are actually doing aren't bought in, then it's not going to work. It's the people who actually do the day-to-day -day work who are, and they're suffering from it or they're, you know, whatever, however, they're putting in long hours, not seeing the, getting the results they want. Once they understand that they need to change and that they need to do something different, then you will get a better buy-in. Yeah, you brought up a very good point in terms of uh, you know bringing the culture uh, into the company, um, and uh, you know just like I know risk is one of the areas that's ignored most in projects, in my opinion. So, uh, based on your experience, what do you do with the companies that don't know the value of risk management to kind of bring them the awareness and uh, to kind of uh, run the risk analysis on projects? Um, well, one of the things is that to is to explain to them that actually if you're you don't really if you didn't have risks you wouldn't have to manage your project it would just happen you wouldn't have to estimate because it would come in on time everything that changes all the obstacles that you have and everything that you're doing in your plan is risk and if if you're managing a project you're managing risk the only thing is is that what you want to do is rather than doing it on a ad hoc or random basis is that you want to put it in so it's consistent. You're doing it consistently and comprehensive. We call it consistent, comprehensive. But if you do it, it's like anything. If you start off and do it once and you do it the same way all the time, you'll start to get the data to back up your, and then you'll go back and say, okay, what could happen? How, what happened last time we did it? Uh, when we had it last time, we had a plan in place. Did it work? Didn't work last time, well, let's try something different. Because you're still going to have the risk. Just because you don't do anything about the risk or you're ignoring it doesn't mean it's going away. So it's still going to happen. So you want to build up over time a knowledge base and expertise to be able to handle that. And the people who do it, the longer they do it, the better they get at it, and the easier it becomes. Because then it becomes a simple, well, we have this project, 
we've had the 10 projects like this. These are the risks that happened. Kind of benchmark. Are they going to, yeah, we yeah. can benchmark. Are they going to happen again? What's new about this new project? Are there any sort of new risks? Do we have new suppliers? We're in a new location. Um, so you can add additional risk, but really it's all there for you. You understand what happened last time, and you understand how to manage it better. Okay. Better, but you know, okay, not right, always perfect. Set. So my last question for yep. you is regarding the future. Uh, how do you foresee the future of project controls? I, um, I think you're going to see a lot more uh, Ability because of the way that the data man, big data, uh, the ability to integrate uh, data from multiple disciplines. Uh, our partner here, um, you might want to uh, uh, interview him as well. Uh, bring it all into one place and, and be able to have a, a much better idea about the, what the root cause analysis and it's it's about data. Uh, as quickly as possible so that you can act upon it. So it's early, uh, rather, because right now the problem is, is uh, a lot of the data is stale. Exactly. It's stale, and by the time you get it, it's too late to do anything about it. So uh, and part of that's big data. It's going to be uh, AI or machine learning that's going to uh, sort of alert people earlier. And it's probably machine learning to if you have the data that we suggest that if you can get a historical record that a, that you can get that machine learning to go back and find all of those that thing and give you a prediction better prediction of what could happen in the future that I, that's sort of yeah that's quite interesting because i'm hearing artificial intelligence over and over from everyone who i talk to well. yeah it seems that it's going to be the path for the future and uh, well it can do a lot of things i mean you're still going to have to bring expert opinion in it yeah definitely and it's still going to have to have someone overseeing it but it will be able to say you know this is what happened this you are that you know it gives you probably give you a much cleaner idea about whether or clearer idea that your estimates and the actions that you're putting in place are going to be effective. Awesome. Thank you very much you're for welcome. your time, Mike. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you oh, so I much. You coming by. Thanks.